Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, the continuing tale of two stories from one city. Homs in Syria, trying to make sense of the news coming out of there. India wants to maintain civility on the internet, but the courts and the government are both accused of going too far. The sun rising or setting on Rupert Murdoch's media empire, while Murdoch the Younger bolts London for New York. And one dog, one camera, and one wild weekend in South Africa. It's our web video of the week. Of all the stories that the media have reported on throughout the Arab Spring, the Syrian uprising has proven to be the most challenging. From the outset of the demonstrations there, the two primary sources of information have been an army of often nameless and faceless activists getting information out via the web, and the Assad government, which is determined to spin the story its way through outlets that the state controls and by denying journalists access. In the chaos of Syria, the coverage has become skewed, polarized between the competing narratives. It is difficult to find anything resembling the middle ground. And this is a dangerous one to cover. This past month, four journalists have lost their lives, and at least two more have been wounded. Our starting point this week is Homs, the city now at the center of the story and at the heart of the media battle for Syria. I've been a journalist for nine years and this is the worst reported conflict I've ever seen. The number of civilian deaths continues to grow. Today, two journalists were among the victims. It really is very hard to be fair and objective in this situation, especially if as a journalist you're not getting treated properly. Where we can't actually move out into the road. The international media has just been too quick to adopt this heroes and villains black and white narrative. I haven't seen a single report that really dealt with the real issues of what the revolution is genuinely about. The coverage has fallen short on just about everything. The reporting on Syria has been long on imagery, woefully short on fact. Whether news audiences around the world realize it or not, they are a long way from getting anything close to the real story. The deadliest day of pro-democracy protests in Syria. This conflict is one which demonstrates unequivocally why you want journalists in on conflict and you want them treated correctly because under the current circumstances where the regime isn't tolerating the foreign journalists and the foreign journalists are sneaking in essentially, you're not getting the full picture of what's going on. And from the regime's point of view, frankly, I think that's not uh, to their advantage. It's kind of like uh, Plato's cave allegory. Uh, people are reporting from outside based on rumors. They're calling activists who are inside. Now, I spoke yesterday to an activist in Homs. He was in the Baba Amal area. I obviously, these activists have an agenda. They're trying to overthrow the regime. And obviously, uh, whether you're in the West or in Qatar, your media organization probably is going to sympathize with that agenda. The regime is not too worried about what I'm seeing. What they're worried about is what Syrians are seeing and they're trying to convey that picture of normality that they think will bring them legitimacy and authority. I, I have my doubts that that's gonna work. The Assad government still wields some useful weapons in this media war, the state-owned outlets it controls. Like Egypt and Libya before it, Syria's state-run channels have been ridiculed for masquerading as legitimate news outlets. But within the country, they continue to have an impact. The Syrian regime can't hide the crimes that are being committed by its forces. But what it can rely on is a centralized propaganda machine. They have access to a number of satellite television channels. They have access to hundreds of Syrian state television and also other television station employees who can work very quickly to promote certain stories. And this is something the opposition doesn't have. The regime, with its media, they are targeting a domestic population. They're not targeting the outside world. They're trying to convince their population that they have legitimacy and that there is this outside conspiracy with spies, with the Mossad, with the CIA, with Al-Qaeda. It's kind of a grand, fantastic narrative. State-run TV even put a conspiratorial spin on the story of journalists killed in Syria. There have been three recently. Rami Al-Sayed, a citizen journalist, and two foreigners, Marie Colvin of the UK's Sunday Times and Remy Oshlik, a French photographer. All three were killed in the shelling of Homs. 
لماذا تسلل هذان الصحفيان سرا ودخلا بشكل غير شرعي الى سوريا ربما تكون هناك خلفيات استخباراتية وارتباطات بمنظمات عسكرية او ارهابية او او وكل شيء ورد وراء دخول هذين الصحفيين بهذا الشكل The message uh, on Syrian state TV seems to me entirely directed towards people who haven't yet entirely joined the protests and aren't yet entirely with the regime. And what they're trying to say is that all this international press coverage is the product of biased press paid for affiliated to a violent terrorist uprising. It's basically the latest verse of a song that they've been singing uh, for the past 40 years, which is uh, everybody's against us, there's a big foreign conspiracy, and we are the Syrian nation. The thing that I found quite humorous actually about the clip was the music playing in the background. Uh, you know, this kind of dramatic, turning into some kind of dramatic Hollywood piece. It's just really over the top propaganda. By now you will have heard that there was an entirely different take on the deaths of the journalists in the foreign media. This is MSNBC in the U.S. And this is what I want to show you tonight. This is what happened in homes. People gathering in the streets there, mourning the deaths of those international journalists who were killed there, trying to cover these people's story. Watch this. Put that way, it is a moving tribute. But like so much of the material sent out of Syria by activists, the question lingers. What was the video actually showing? The people in Homs are very desperate. And the fact that this very famous journalist has come to their city and the fact that she died there, I think they utilized this very, in a very clever way to make huge media capital out of it. There is something amazing about seeing the depth of feeling for these journalists. They have demonstrations every night in Homs, of course. And I can assure you that the loss of these two journalists was no more tragic for the Syrian demonstrators in Homs than a loss of their brothers and sisters and fathers and sons, which is happening on a daily basis. But of course, they're very desperate for more media attention, and they want to encourage media to come in to focus on the issues that they want them to focus on. There's nothing other than the placards being held by the person behind the camera indicating what the context of this celebration is. So it's not entirely clear that there's a correlation between what's being indicated on the placards and what's actually on the minds of those that are doing the dancing down below. This is now an all-out propaganda battle between a state-run machine and an army of new media rebels. The degrees may vary, but both sides are more than willing to sacrifice truth in the quest for victory. The foreign journalists who go to places like Homs to try to lift the fog of this war are becoming casualties of it. They've already paid the ultimate price, but what makes it even worse is that their deaths, their own stories, have become just more grist for the propaganda mill that Syria has become. Our Global Village Voice is now on the continuing battle over the story in Syria. In my view, uh, in Syria's case, mainstream media fueled by social media sources continue to make this classical mistake of focusing on the more sensational armed opposition, which is important, uh, but is totally ignoring the less interesting but more critical political opposition inside. It's interesting how modern-day propaganda works in Syria, particularly after the recent constitutional referendum. I've seen firsthand the dramatic difference between what's on the streets in Syria and what makes its way to the mainstream media by way of Syrian state-run television. This is one of the few times that I, as a political journalist, feel that embedded or even amateur video from the streets might actually be the best method for the rest of the world to see the truth about the political and governmental condition. We're always looking for new faces for the program. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the news media as one of our Global Village voices, you can always connect with us on Facebook or Twitter where we will let you know what stories we're working on. You can also get in touch with us via email at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. And don't forget our free video podcast on iTunes. Just look for the Listening Post, Al Jazeera English, and you'll find us there. 
Time now for listening post news bites. We've been following a high profile libel case brought against Ecuador's El Universo newspaper by the country's president. Now the paper has some good news to print on that. President Rafael Correa has pardoned three executives and a former columnist at the newspaper. They had all been sentenced to three years in jail, and the paper was fined a total of $40 million after being convicted of libel charges against the president. The case centered on a newspaper column which referred to Correa as the dictator and accused him of ordering troops to shoot at a hospital full of civilians during a police uprising. Human rights groups have suggested the libel case was part of a broader attempt on Correa's part to intimidate journalists and silence critical voices within the country. The president, however, insists that he is the victim of a biased media establishment which represents the interests of the political right. If there is a dictatorship in Ecuador, Correa says, it's the dictatorship of the media. With Russia in the middle of a presidential election, there's a theory making the rounds that a strategically placed report on state-run television was invented to boost the chances of Vladimir Putin. The state broadcaster Channel One reported that Russian and Ukrainian intelligence services worked to foil an assassination plot aimed at Putin. According to that report, which was picked up by broadcasters around the world, the Chechen suspects admitted to planning to make their move in Moscow right after the vote, and that the order came from Chechen Islamist leader Doku Umarov, who the Russian media have long labeled Russia's Osama bin Laden. But here's the skeptic's take on that, and it's all over the web. The report was nothing more than propaganda ahead of the elections. The suspects were reportedly arrested weeks ago, and the story only surfaced when it did to rally last-minute support behind Putin. The fallout over the phone hacking scandal has claimed its biggest name so far. James Murdoch is no longer in charge of News International, the British newspaper arm of his father's company. The younger Murdoch is moving from London to New York, where he will focus on News Corporation's global television division as chief operating officer. That puts him in charge of News Corp's most profitable wing. 70% of the company's revenues come from television. News Corporation put out a lengthy press release on the appointment, which somehow mentioned not a single word about the phone hacking scandal in which James Murdoch was embroiled and which led to the closure of News of the World. The development came just four days after James's father, Rupert, launched The Sun on Sunday to replace the news of the world. News International says the new Sunday paper sold around 3.2 million copies. However, many media analysts called the tabloid relatively tame and boring, and they speculated it was aimed primarily at a readership of one, Justice Levison, who was heading up the inquiry into phone hacking. That inquiry continues to hear disturbing new evidence, according to an email written by the former legal head of News International, Tom Crone, both the former editor of the News of the World, Andy Coulson, and the former head of News International, Rebecca Brooks, were made aware that phone hacking was endemic at the paper back in 2006. And that contradicts statements they both made in 2009 on James Murdoch's watch after The Guardian reported that phone hacking was in fact widespread. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks are at it again, this time releasing the first 300 of 5 million emails the organization claims were intercepted from the servers of a private U.S. intelligence firm, Stratfor. Assange trumpeted the release of what he called the Global Intelligence Files at the Frontline Club in London. Today, WikiLeaks begins its release of... This time, however, the emails were not leaked emails. by an internal whistleblower. They were hacked by the online activist group Anonymous and then passed on to WikiLeaks. Assange said his site has teamed up with 25 other media organizations on this story, although the media partners in this case are much smaller outlets than the New York Times and The Guardian, which WikiLeaks has collaborated with in the past. Assange also says that Stratfor presents itself as a media organization, but underneath it runs a network of paid informants and monitors political activists on behalf of governments and corporations around the world. Now, compared to leaks in the past, this first batch of the global intelligence files received comparatively little media coverage. However, with 4,999,700 emails still to surface, that could very well change. One would think that a Minister of Communications might be able to spin his own policy proposals successfully. However, last year, Kapil Sibyl, the man in charge of India's Ministry of Communications, stirred up a storm when news leaked of his idea to pre-screen 
all of India's online content to prevent what he called offensive material from getting on the web. Five months later, India's online censorship story has not gone away. While the minister has backtracked on his proposal, he now says he was misquoted, Google, Microsoft and Yahoo are among 22 internet companies awaiting a verdict in a case in which they are accused of being legally responsible for allegedly offensive material posted by users on their sites. While the internet companies fight that case in court, there's already a lot of online content that Indians will never see. That's because of a law that creates what internet watchdogs call India's information black holes. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the fight over internet freedom in the world's largest democracy. Our top story, the anti-corruption wave sweeping the nation. Indians from every corner have joined in, from Mumbai, from Bangalore, and even New Delhi. 2011 was the year of the anti-corruption protest in India. Led by a 73-year-old activist named Anna Hazare, hundreds of thousands of Indians came out onto the streets to protest the institutionalized corruption that's rife in India today. Amongst the demonstrators was a young cartoonist, Asim Trivedi. He wasn't just a street activist. Trivedi had his own website, cartoonsagainstcorruption.com, and he'd become something of an online star. Then, the Indian authorities decided to pull his website down. We were at the site of Anna Hazari's anti-corruption protest and I started getting calls that my website wasn't opening. I found out that that afternoon my domain provider, Big Rock, had suspended my site. A local politician and lawyer had complained about some of my cartoons and the police ordered that my site be shut down. In less than 24 hours, in remarkable efficiency, otherwise not seen in Indian law, the website domain name was suspended. Now this is a classic case of internet censorship in India where a site has been removed without the accused person being given a chance to defend himself in a court of law. So content can just disappear like that. Uh, like in the book 1984 with the memory holes. They, it's as though the content never existed, there's no trace of it. But Asim Trivedi had prepared himself for the takedown. Within days, his cartoons were back on the net. Thankfully, I had backups of all my work, all my cartoons. So although my site had been banned, I started a blog immediately called cartoonsagainstcorruption.blogspot.com. Instances of internet takedowns are growing more and more frequent in India. Last year, 22 internet companies were taken to court over material posted on their sites that allegedly offended religious sentiments. Among the companies were Google and Facebook, and in February this year, a court injunction forced them to remove the content from their sites. There's a specific section of the Indian IT Act that's fueling this situation. Introduced by the government in April last year, the intermediary guidelines rules have tightened the screws on web companies who host content on their sites. Those who stand to be affected by the law say it effectively removes any obligation for due process when pulling material off the web. The intermediary guidelines rules and the cyber cafe rules are uh, horrendous, quite frankly. I can send a letter to any website asking them to remove some content which I find may be objectionable and the website has to either remove it in 36 hours or I can go to the government against the website. As we found out in a, in a policy sting operation that we carried out, most intermediaries will remove content even based on frivolous complaints. So six out of seven intermediaries actually removed content that we asked for. For instance, we asked for a comment about separation of states to be removed, calling it racially and ethnically objectionable, while quite clearly it wasn't. Yet, the intermediary removed it, and not just removed that, but removed some 15 other comments underneath it as well, uh, which we hadn't even pointed out as being uh, objectionable. Asim Trivedi and other Indian political bloggers say they are the targets of the recent push to clean up cyber content in India. The government says its focus is on material that causes religious offence. In a country home to over six major religions, that's a legitimate concern. But the reality is, the government's vigilance is less about religion than it is about politics. Google's latest transparency report shows that in the six months from January to June 2011, 
Various arms of the Indian government made a total of 358 requests to Google to remove web content. More than two-thirds of those requests had nothing to do with religious content or hate speech. The issues they were dealing with were political. So it's very really clear what they really want. Very few of the uh, requests to Google to remove content were about national security or religious hate speech and so on. Most of it was political. The year 2011 saw the country rocked by scams of all natures. We saw ministers tweeting. We saw people lose their jobs because they tweeted inappropriately. So the online media has been a bugbear for a few years now. The Anna Hazare movement was a flashpoint where the online world scaled up like crazy. <laughs> I drew a cartoon in which I said India's parliament should be renamed the National Toilet. We've seen for years that members of parliament are paid bribes. They're unashamed about it, and the laws that come into effect have no relation to what we want. The other cartoon that caused government displeasure was about the country's national motto, Long Live Truth. I said it should be changed to Long Live Corruption. The question is not about whether uh, there is content online that deserves to be removed. Of course there is, and, and I'd be the last person to, to say otherwise. The question is really about how this, sh this process should happen. The owners of the content, they don't even know their content has been removed. So this is invisible censorship where you do it clandestinely behind the scenes without telling anybody, without taking a press release that we've blocked this website precisely so that there is no public criticism. India doesn't have the highest internet penetration in the world, or even in Asia. But with just 10.2% of the country's population online, India is the world's third largest internet market. And in the next two years, the estimates are that 200 million Indians will join the global web community. So it's not surprising that the government is nervous of growing political criticism online. With 121 million people online and online all the time, uh, platforms like Twitter and Facebook and the blogs are mainstream media. They're no longer niche media, they're no longer rebel media. With the proliferation of computers and smartphones, this is going to explode. This is already an explosive issue. And in the proliferation of online voices, there are undoubtedly Indians who have gone too far. But in a country which often boasts it's the world's largest democracy, the government stands accused of silencing too many voices through an internet policy that feels more like Beijing than New Delhi. More Global Village voices now on India and online content. I think there's numerous reasons why the government is demanding censorship, but two key ones come to mind. I think that one, it's a lack of understanding of how the internet works, and two, it's a knee-jerk reaction to change. The government no longer has a full understanding of how information is exchanged among its citizens. And it's upsetting the status quo. People feel a certain freedom. They get carried away with their comments and their opinions. They see the internet as a platform for global expression. Now, the unedited nature of the internet adds a certain zing to it. There's a certain openness about the internet. And people who do not understand the zing, they will never understand the internet, which is about 99% of India right now. Finally, how many times have you heard this media critique, that the worst thing about the World Wide Web is the preponderance of stupid cat videos on it, and the billions of hours that people waste watching all those videos? Well, we could not agree more, and we strongly feel that the solution is more dog videos, if only to redress the imbalance. Dave Minert in South Africa strapped a GoPro camera onto his friend's dog, then he let the dog run loose on the streets and beaches of Cape Town for the entire weekend. He turned it into a music video that gives you a great dog's eye view of the city and the world. It's our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post.